Chapter 11. I can't believe he's doing this to me, too. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 11, I can't believe he's doing this to me, too, though he was desperate not to do this. So Vyeshu called in his servants and secretaries and gave them an order. I need a lady in dot waiting to serve Rashta. You all must have female relatives. I want each of you to recommend two people for me. The emperor's concubine was in an odd position, as both the subject of much attention and envy, as well as criticism and contempt. So Vyesha thought that Rashta's status as a commoner must have hurt the noble's pride. For this reason, some emperors married their concubine to another aristocrate to forge a noble identity, but there was too much talk about Rashta to conceal her background. For a month or a year, the nobles would only pretend to be friendly to Rashta, so long as Sovieshu continued to care for her. Because no one would volunteer, he had no choice but to give an order. She needs to have a peer, so be mindful about the age difference. The servants and secretaries exchanged awkward glances among themselves. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, you're talking about this, this runaway slave. Are you crazy? Father. How can you say that to mother? Baron Lance's hands were trembling and sweating profusely. Runaway slave. No, she's not a runaway slave, she's a commoner, even if she's not a runaway slave. It's still a problem because everyone thinks so. Baroness Lant put her hands on her hips and glared at her husband. You want me to serve a runaway slave? People will laugh at you, and our Jess, as well as me. The Baron Lant is below a slave. Baron Lant believed that Rashta was a charming and lovely woman, and that one day other nobles would fall for the new concubine. But that was the future, and it's clear that people in society today had a bad opinion of Rashta. Unfortunately, what Baroness Lant said was true. What about on your side, your niece AC are suggesting we decide her future for her because she isn't your niece? Even among your extended family there are at least three nieces, no. You don't know their personalities. They aren't just someone you can put into another person's care. Oh my, see this. What's the excuse now? As the Baron and Baroness Land argued with each other, the other servants and secretaries found themselves in similar circumstances. Everyone shook their heads while talking about the runaway slave. However, they weren't in the position to back down like the Empress. In the end, Count Pernu and Baron Land were ordered by the Emperor to bring their female relatives to the palace for a month. Asterisk 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 I thought Sovieshu would force me to inquire the noblewomen again. But somehow, three days later, my ladies dot in dot waiting informed me that Count Pernu's daughter and a Baron Lance distant relative would serve as Rashta's companions. Setting aside Baron Lance's relative, it was surprising that Count Pernu's daughter would take on the job. Isn't that young lady's name Helen? I knew that the Pernu family was a strong household. Yes, your majesty. Yet Helen somehow was the lady and dot waiting. Helen is inquisitive and has a good relationship with her father. Maybe she's here for the Count's sake. I suppose so. I nodded and did not bring it up anymore. Fortunately, a few hours later, I completely forgot about Rashta when I went for a walk and found the handsome bird once again. The ladies dot and dot waiting were amazed when the bird flew and hovered before me. Oh, the bird's here again. See how it goes to the Empress. Amazing. The bird had another note on its leg. But I'm smarter than a bird. I'm sobering up now. I chuckled as I read the note. It was for no big reason in particular, I just laughed. I watered the bird, then quickly wrote a reply. Looks like you're not fully sober yet. What's the bird's name? The ladies giggled again after seeing my note. Everyone mused on whether it was fun to write such letters. I kissed the bird's small head and launched it into the sky, and it flapped its wings and flew away. This time I ended the letter with a question. Would the person who received the letter reply to me again? I like to think so. Asterisk 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 the name I temporarily forgot about arrived back in my ears not long after. Empress. I've come to ask you something about Rashta. I was busy discussing the New Year's preparations with the Minister of Finance when Sovieshu brought her up. Is it urgent? 
I glanced at my watch, as if I had already finished my work day. If it was not urgent, we could talk later. There was no rush about Rashta. Instead of replying to me, Sovietia looked at the minister, who stood up awkwardly from his seat and walked away. All the other officials followed suit. In a moment, only the two of us were left in the room. What's going on? Sovietia looked at me beyond the large table. As I said, it's about Rashta. Please, couldn't he solve the concubine's problems on his own? I nodded, pressing down the words in my throat. All right. Did you spread rumors that Rashta is a runaway slave? That story again. Except he was more specific than before. Last time he only asked if I said something strange. I looked at him in trepidation. Not only do Rashta's new ladies dot and dot waiting do not treat her properly, but they also don't act as ladies dot and dot waiting at all. Your Majesty, I don't want to be involved in any way with your concubine. But why do they ignore Rashta at every turn and compare everything she does to the Empress? Poor Rashta hid it and didn't say a word to me. If I hadn't seen the ladies dot and dot waiting behavior by accident, I wouldn't have known it was happening. Shouldn't we ask the ladies dot and dot waiting? I asked, and they said they didn't want to serve a runaway slave. You are truly unreasonable. Chapter 12 My Nest, 1 You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 12 My Nest, 1 In the end, I could not tolerate it anymore and spoke my mind. Sovietia stared at me in amazement. My eyes were hot with unshed tears, but I bit my tongue to hold them back. The Empress should not cry as a matter of pride. They said they heard rumors, not that I said them. Are you blaming me for rumors for which you don't know the source? No matter how much I think about it, there isn't anyone else but you who could benefit from it. What would I gain? Rashta is like a romantic rival to you, is she not? Dot. Wasn't it you who told me the story of Rashta being a runaway slave? You never said a word about the source of the rumor then. I didn't know before, but it could have been you from the beginning. Sovietia's accusation was one dot sided and insulting. I managed to steady my breath and keep my composure. But the more I tried to keep calm, the more suspicious Sovietia seemed to be of me. It took a moment, but finally I managed to force out a voice that sounded normal. Your concubine is not a rival to me. What? You are not my lover, so how can she be a threat to me? Sovietia's expression wavered. I straightened my back and gave him a smile practiced hundreds of times in front of a mirror. The concubine is precious to you, while I am just like everyone else. I am tiring of this, so let me say it again, your majesty don't get me involved with you and your concubine. I whirled around and saw myself through the door. The finance minister was nervously pacing down the hallway, and he turned his head in my direction. His eyes widened when his gaze fell upon me. It was obvious that I couldn't manage my facial expressions. I smiled at him, then quickly left the hallway and made to the western grounds. I ran to my secluded nest chair where there were no ladies dot and dot waiting and buried myself inside. I hugged my body and stifled my sobs as best I could. The Empress does not cry. She does not cry in front of others. In my head, Sovietia and his concubine were so small and unimportant that they could not shake me. But in my heart, there was a hole. Eventually, it turned dark. I stayed cocooned in my chair for a long time. I was sure that my ladies dot and dot waiting were searching for me, and I slowly unfolded my body. After sitting curled in one position for hours, my arms and legs were as stiff as a wooden doll. Then, there was a piercing shriek from afar. I looked up from my nest chair and saw a large bird coming down from the sky. Ah! Uh. It was the handsome bird, the one that brought the note from the drunken foreigner. It headed for me again, then landed in my lap and peered at me up close. It looked so adorable that I burst into giggles, and the bird blinked its large eyes and tilted its head. You came to see me. Again, a note was tied to the bird's leg. I unfurled the note and saw written in neat script, does it need a name? You can give it one if necessary. I studied the bird, and the bird looked back at me. Its gaze felt more penetrating than usual. 
Did it know that I was feeling depressed? Bird. Bird. I looked into its bright eyes and almost believed that it understood me. No, that was foolish, but intelligent birds could understand people, right? I hesitated for a moment, looked around, then hugged the bird and whispered to its feathery head. This is my secret place. The bird shifted and gave me a blank look. I petted the bird's back and continued again awkwardly. There's nowhere I can cry. But here I can cry to my heart's content. It's a secret, so don't tell anyone else. The bird blinked its large eyes again. Then, it slowly lifted a wing and brushed it against my cheek as if to comfort me, and I smiled. Nice bird. I kissed its head in gratitude, and the bird made a funny squawking noise and tapped the note with its beak. Did it want a reply? It was a really clever creature. Fortunately, I carried note paper and a pocket pen with me. I took them out, meditated on the right name for the bird, and wrote it down. The bird's name is the queen. When I finished the note, I looked up to see the bird staring at my writing as if it could read the letters. The bird tapped the word queen with a large claw. That's your name. If you could give this to your master. I tied the note to the bird's leg, then gently hugged it again. The Empress. Yes, no matter what happened, I was the Empress. No matter what Sovietia said, the concubine was the concubine and the Empress was the Empress. I pulled out a handkerchief, patted the swollen area around my eyes, and took a breath. Remember what my mother said, I shouldn't get involved with them. People don't expect me to be an Empress that is loved by the Emperor. My goal in life is not to be loved by the Emperor either. I had learned and lived to be the most perfect Empress. I was human, and I would be hurt, but I couldn't sink into despair. I already had enough pity for myself. Now I had to get up. I drew my breath, kissed the bird's head again, and let it fly into the sky. The bird seemed unwilling to part with me for a moment and circled once over my head, but it finally turned away and flew far away. I practiced my smile once more, then returned to the palace. Asterisk 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 the large bird flew straight to a nearby mountain. It skimmed the trees until it found a suitable outcrop, which was already occupied with a flock of birds, and landed there. The appearance of the large bird sent the other smaller birds scattering, and the large bird perched itself on a rock in the open space. Then, incredibly, the bird transformed into a young man. He was handsome, extremely so, and his entire body was finely proportioned and shaped with well-defined muscles. Calling a male a queen. The young man grumbled to himself and scratched his head. A bluebird, which was sitting on a nearby tree, hopped down and also transformed into a man, this time with blue hair. The blue-dot-haired man pulled a red cape from another tree and started to scold the other. What do you mean? You said you were going to scout. You didn't go anywhere else, did you? Oh, dot, oh. No, I've been scouting. Four beauties. What are you talking about? I went to the palace, the palace. Are you sure? The handsome young man grimaced when the blue dot haired man stared at him distrustfully. You don't believe me. The blue dot haired man swung the red cape around the young man's shoulders. That will never happen. But please pay attention to your actions, your highness. Remember that you are the heir to the Western Kingdom. Chapter 13 My Nest, Too You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 13 My Nest, Too It seemed that I dropped my handkerchief when I pulled out my pen yesterday. I searched all over my room, but I couldn't find the handkerchief I usually carried with me. I went to work as usual at the Central Palace, then headed to the Western Garden during lunch. It's all right. The Empress won't be here at this time. Does the Empress really own the entire palace? Only the Empress' bedroom is hers. The Empress often visits here too, so why not Miss Rashta as well? I heard laughter and conversation as I approached my nest chair, and I stopped right before the bushes to observe what was happening. Rasta was sitting in my nest chair while a maidservant pushed it like a swing. The other maid had brought a table and was even cutting fruit. Hot anger seared through my chest. Did the concubine still not know that the Western Palace was the domain of the Empress? 
no, she must know if she was avoiding me. I could barely tolerate the fact that someone I didn't like was enjoying themselves in my chair. Well, the Empress would never come to such a small place. If Rashta doesn't sit in it, the chair will be lonely, right? Miss Rashta, you adorable little thing. You are so different from the other young ladies. You are so innocent. Why? What about the others? Well, nobles make their debut in society at the age of 17. After that, they need to be cunning. There's a lot of fighting and backstabbing involved. Miss Rashta, don't get involved with them, or they'll eat you alive. Rashta smiled, then turned and suddenly caught sight of me. A. Ah. Uh. Your Majesty. Rashta jumped to her feet. The maids, who had been speaking ill of the nobility, also stepped back in surprise. Two new ladies dot and dot waiting were nowhere to be seen. Supposedly they did not get along with Rashta, and they must have been sent back by Sovietshu or the maids. I pushed aside a few stems and approached them, my eyes fixed on the nest chair. When Rashta stood up, I spotted my handkerchief behind her dress. She had used the handkerchief to sit on my nest chair. When Rashta saw the direction of my gaze, she spoke up hurriedly. This isn't trash, your majesty. It's very beautiful. I know the chair is not trash. It's my chair. Rashta flinched at my clipped tone. I counted to the number 10 in the old language. That chair was my cherished possession, and this was my secret place. I was angry that Sovietia's concubine invaded my precious spot. I, your majesty. Why do you look so frightening? Rashta's voice was short on breath, but I couldn't open my mouth to reply. It was not forbidden for anyone else to be here. While I never saw other people with my own eyes, anyone else could have used this chair. And yet, anger flared in my chest at the thought of Rashta using it. Concubines were not supposed to come here to the Western Palace to see the Empress. However, it was unbecoming for an Empress to take offense for someone sitting in a chair, and those maids would certainly gossip about the nobles like they did before. I managed to steady my breathing and repeated to myself to never get angry in any way. Your Majesty, the handkerchief you are sitting on is mine, too. As I managed to force my anger down, Rashta turned back quickly in surprise. The maids glanced at each other and bowed their heads. I'm sorry, Your Majesty. Rashta didn't know. It was just by the chair, you did it without knowing. But don't come to the West Palace anymore. It's not good that we see each other. B. But Rashta wants to be friends with Her Majesty, Rashta was in tears, and the maids looked on in pity. They probably already thought I was a mean woman who was offended over a chair or handkerchief. Seeing Rashta so upset, I deliberately smiled and said something to shock her. You can be friends with the next concubine. The next concubine. The next concubine that the emperor will bring in after you. I only returned what she said to me. Rashta turned pale and looked at me with a wounded expression. She bowed her head and ran away, and her maids chased after her. I stood alone and gazed at my nest chair and my crushed handkerchief. I didn't feel good. It was the same chair and handkerchief that I had before, but, I found no cheer in them. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, your majesty. Sovietio found himself surprised when he visited Rashta after work. As soon as he entered the room, a sobbing Rashta leapt into his arms. What's wrong? Why are you crying? Did a lady and dot waiting insult you again? Your Majesty, when you get tired of Rashta, will you bring another woman as your concubine? What? Who said that? He stared at her dumbfounded, and she cried out, the Empress. The Empress. Sovietia frowned as if he found it difficult to believe. Why would the Empress suddenly say that to you? No, where did you meet her? There is an abandoned chair in the West Palace Garden. No one was using it, so Rashta was playing there, did you go to the West Palace again? I went when the Empress wasn't there. And it was at the secluded garden, not near the building, your majesty. Tears poured down Rashta's face in rivulets, and Sovietia sighed and wiped them away with his sleeve. So, you were sitting in a chair that no one was using. And you were avoiding the Empress. 
I don't know. She had a scary face, and Art Rashta said I want to be friends with the Empress. And she insinuated that I would bring another concubine when I tired of you. She didn't say that exactly, but she meant it. Is that really true? Will you love another woman besides Rashta? Your Majesty, are you going to cheat on Rashta? That's not possible. Are you sure? You're not the kind of man to cheat. Rashta stared widely at him with her doe eyes, and Sovietio hugged her tightly and repeated his answer. Her trembling finally calmed down. Sovietio rubbed Rashta's back, frowning. Chapter 14 Where is Queen? 1. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 14 Where is Queen? 1. I returned to my palace after finishing my work, then slipped into comfortable clothes more quickly than usual. I felt my head throbbing, possibly because of the constant feeling of something bothering me. I was slowly starting to understand my mother's words of, you do not get involved in the affairs of the emperor and his concubine. But mother, even if I try not to care, she keeps appearing in front of me. Countess Eliza. Yes, your majesty. About my mother, no, never mind. You want me to bring Duchess Troby? No, it's all right. I'll see her on New Year's anyway. You should consult the Duchess if you're feeling uneasy, Your Majesty. Counsel would probably ease my mind. But if I spoke to her, my mother's mind would be a thorny path from then on, and I didn't want to burden my her with my problems. She already thought about me all the time. I'll keep it to myself for now. I can tell her later. Mother must have heard about Rashta anyway. I will. Ah, uh, is Lady Laura all right? Yes. She wants to return to the palace as soon as possible. Tell her she can come back whenever he wants. Preferably before New Year's. That way, people won't talk. Yes, Your Majesty a value impression placeholder talking about Laura made me miss her bright energy. The Countess left the room for a moment, and I unpinned the jewels from my hair and placed them on the dresser. I'm going to go to bed a little early today. I should skip dinner. Instead, I sat at my desk and opened my notebook. There was the click of the door behind me, but I didn't turn around, thinking it was the Countess. However, the presence stood silent behind my back. That was not what the Countess would do. As I was dipping my pen into the inkwell, I frowned and turned around. Your Majesty. To my surprise, it was Sovietiu standing behind me. How long had it been since my husband came to the Western Palace? Rather than being happy at his presence, I looked on anxiously. It was sure to be another difficult conversation with him. May I help you, Your Majesty? Why do people change so much? Of course it was going to be another uncomfortable encounter. I had a terrible feeling, and wondered if it had anything to do with Sovietiu in my room. Change. I heard about the bad things you said to Rashta. Rashta. A mere small woman. But her name and presence stuck stubbornly to my feet wherever I went. What did I say? You said that I would take another concubine after her. Rather than trying to be friendly to me, I told her to be friendly with another concubine when she comes. Value impression placeholder I thought. Did I say something wrong? She spoke without malice. Must you act so cynical? I've changed. You've changed. Empress. How many times do I have to repeat that I don't want to get involved with you and your concubine? Yet it does not stop me from hearing about her. If you and Miss Rashta left me be, I wouldn't be so cynical. I had to come because it was necessary. If you hadn't said those things to Rashta, I wouldn't have come here. I shouted, not from excitement, but from finding something that would hurt Sovietiu the most. Did the former emperor ever talk about Countess Sophie to the former empress? Sovietiu paled when I brought up the subject of the former emperor's favored lover. I didn't know you were such a gossiper. He gestured his arms around the room. This room is full of beautiful furniture, and you can buy anything you want. You are cruel to someone who has lived their life pitifully. Sovietiu's eyes filled with disappointment. She was also a subject of the empress before she was my concubine. 
Do you not feel sorry for her? Yes. As soon as I said that single word, my legs became weak. I hold on to the dressing table to prevent my legs from folding underneath myself, and that was when Countess Eliza came in the room and rushed towards me. She carefully hugged me and comforted me in her arms. Asterisk 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 really? The emperor was angry with the empress because of Rashta. I think so. They were shouting at the top of their voices. Charily gave a bitter smile, and Rashta covered her face with both her hands, wow, the emperor is incredible, the other maid, Kisu, continued the story. Not only that, but he declared a strict punishment to anyone who brings up the false rumor that you're a runaway slave. The faces of the two maids blurred behind Rashta's tears. The emperor really loves you, Miss Rashta. Yes, well, how could anyone not love someone so beautiful and innocent? The emperor and Rashta are like lovers in fairy tales. It really is like a fairy tale. Rashta bowed her head and wiggled her toes shyly. Rashta is so happy these days. I feel like I'm dreaming every day. She was not prepared when a moment later, three servants entered the room to deliver a large swing chair. He mood grew even brighter. This is. This is a gift from the emperor to Rashta. He said you can sit here without going to the palace. Unlike the nest chair in the western palace, the fixture and decorations of this chair were all made of jewels, gold, and silver. The cushions and feather dot stuffed cushions were made of the finest material and heavenly soft. Rashta burst into tears of joy and exchanged happy looks with her maids. Chapter 15 Where is Queen? 1. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 15, Where is Queen? 1. I lay crying in bed when I heard a tap on my window. I looked up dully, and to my surprise, I saw the handsome bird hovering outside. I hesitated before opening the window, and the bird hopped onto my bed, picked its wings and stared at me. You arrived quickly this time. I wiped away my tears, and the bird peered at me with its large eyes, like it had seen me crying. It was such a clever bird. Is your master near? The bird nodded as if it understood my words. I lifted the bird and placed it on my lap, and it froze for a moment and blinked rapidly. I brushed its head then pulled the note from its leg. The bird will be named Queen, but keep in mind that he is a male. It was a short but efficient sentence again. The heaviness in my mind lifted, and I smiled at the words of this stranger who I had neither face nor name for. You're a boy. The bird flapped his wings as if miffed by my ignorance, but in my defense, I didn't know the difference between the males and females of this species. I patted his head again then went to my desk, and the bird followed. I took out a sheet of paper and wrote a reply. I didn't know he was male. An unexpected surprise. I rolled up the note and tied it to the bird's leg, then glanced at the calendar. The New Year's celebrations were just around the corner. Some of the guests would start arriving early tomorrow at the palace. The owner of the bird was already nearby. Would they come tomorrow? Asterisk the next morning, the lord and lady of the Lux region arrived, as well as other distinguished guests from the neighboring countries. The guests' reception were divided for either me, Sovietshu, or the foreign minister. Most of the time, they went to Sovietshu. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. There is an arrival from the Western Kingdom. If it's the Western Kingdom, yes, I believe it's Prince Heinle. The prince was one of the few guests I had to personally greet. I nodded and stood up, and the officials supervising the guest list followed suit. I gestured to them to sit down, then walked towards a large mirror, arranged my dress, and went to the reception room. Prince Heinle was the younger brother of the King of the West, and the second son of their father. However, Heinle was the heir to the throne as the king had no children, despite already having a queen and three official concubines. Rumors abounded that because of the king's infertility and poor physical condition these days, Prince Heinle would likely inherit the throne. In spite of that, the Western Kingdom was already similar in size and power to the Eastern Empire. Of course, I would go and welcome the special guest myself. I entered the White Rose Room, and when I looked at the delegation I stopped breathing when I saw the man at the head. 
I had often heard rumors about this man's beautiful appearance. As soon as one entered into high society, one could not escape talk of Prince Heinle. Word was that he was a woman's ear, he had a violent personality, he was indescribably handsome. He killed or backstabbed people with a smile on his face, or that it wasn't that the king of the Western Kingdom was incapable of having children, but that the prince killed each of them. I could not decipher from all the rumors whether Prince Heinle was a womanizer or a cruel person. But one thing was certain. His appearance. He, he really was beautiful. His blonde hair fell into soft, tousled waves on his face, and his lips curved into a delicate bow. He bore a strong neck and broad shoulders, but what was most striking about him were his mysterious violet eyes. Even if he were to stand in the corner with his mouth shut, he would stir all kinds of rumors. I stood opposite of Prince Heinle, admiring him as surreptitiously as I could. He was only a prince, but he was from the esteemed Western Kingdom, and so I treated him with the respect of a crown prince. I stood across from him, but before I could say anything, Prince Heinle bent one knee and reached out his hand like a knight swearing a vow of loyalty. I gave him my hand, upon which he placed a gentle kiss. But the difference between the knights was clear. The knights lowered their eyes or stared towards the front as they gave a kiss of loyalty. This man, however, stared straight into my eyes and held my gaze captive. It's an honor to meet you, Empress. He released my hand and smiled, and I felt my stomach knot for some reason. I thought the rumor that he was cruel was more true than the one of him being a womanizer, as I saw no lechery in his eyes. Instead, he was like an eagle observing me from above, despite the fact that he was kneeling before me. It's an honor to meet you as well, Prince Heinle. I wouldn't let myself be crushed by him, of course. I wore a dignified expression born through years of training. He smiled softly and rose to his knees. It must have been a difficult journey, and I hope you will rest and enjoy it here until New Year's Day. I've always heard praise for the Imperial Palace of the Eastern Empire. It's very beautiful. I hope you will find it pleasing. The prince's eyes squinted in a smile at the ceremonial greeting. I am already pleased. Asterisk 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 the amount of work required from me was halved after the arrival of the special guests, and most of what was left was for the celebrations themselves. I finished my work earlier than usual and returned to the Western Palace. Laura, who returned to her position as my lady in not waiting, quickly approached me. Your Majesty, Your Majesty. How was he? How was Prince Heinle? Is he beautiful like the rumors say? The other ladies dot and dot waiting approached an interest, teacups in hand. They set them down in various corners, like the window frame, on the dresser, on the tea table, then went to work in helping me change. I heard that the Grand Duke Chrome fainted when he saw Prince Heinle. Is that really true? I heard a famous theater actress went on a date with him once, then chased him for three years. Although the ladies dot and dot waiting would see him in a few days, they could not bear their patience. I replied to satiate their craving, remembering Prince Heinle's steady gaze, purple eyes and sharp charisma that could be felt from a distance. He was the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Without a doubt. Laura let out a small scream of exclamation. Wow. I can't wait to see him. What was his voice like? It's the best voice I've ever heard. It was not an exaggeration. The ladies put their hands on their hearts while swooning. I'm already looking forward to what gossip the handsome prince will bring. I'm sure many are already thinking about it. While they were curious about Prince Heinle's appearance, they were also looking forward to the drama he would bring. I smiled as I listened to their conversation, when there was a tap on the window. It was Queen, wrapping the glass with his beak. Are you here already? I opened the window, and he landed on the sill and blinked at me. Now that I thought about it, Queen also had gold feathers and purple eyes. It was hard to imagine that he could survive in the wild with such conspicuous colors, suddenly, I worried if it was all right to use a bird like this as a messenger. Queen held out his foot as if he wanted me to read the note as soon as possible. I opened the note and sat at my desk, while the ladies dot and dot waiting occupied themselves in feeding Queen. The handwriting was familiar, the message playful. I arrived at the Imperial Palace. Do you know who I am? 
Chapter 16. Want to make a bet. 1. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 16. Want to make a bet. 1. He was already here. The guests started entering the palace today. I mentally filed through all the arrivals. It was difficult to pinpoint one person from the abundance of guests. There were Grand Duke Chrome and his wife, the Grand Duke Liltiang, the Chancellor and his family from the Northern Kingdom, the children of Duchess Cranthia from Samano, Prince Heinle from the Western Kingdom, Emperor Serum of Blue Bohean. The problem was that they did not come in twos or threes. Just from the Grand Duke and his wife, there were also the knights, the servants, and escorts, and then multiply that number by several times to account for the other guests. I didn't know if the letter came from a woman or man, if they were young or old, or what status they were. It was almost impossible to determine Queen's owner. I don't know who you are. I considered it a little more and then added, do you know who I am? I was sure they didn't know. I was one of countless people living in the palace. As soon as I finished writing the letter, Queen hopped to my side. This birdie is quite clever, your majesty. Even while cleaning his feathers, he seems to be trying to make eye contact with you, your majesty. The ladies dot in dot waiting burst out laughing when Queen butted his head towards me. Really? I stroked the bird's head, and he made a pleased sound and half dot closed his eyes. I rolled up the note and tied it to the bird's leg, and he fluttered his wings and landed on the bed in a small dance before leaping back out the window. What a clever bird! The owner themselves would have to be quite intelligent to raise a bird like that. What kind of person were they? A young woman of my age like Laura. An elegant old lady or gentleman. A prodigal nobleman. A knight who knows nothing but the sword. Do you like birds, your majesty? Countess Eliza came by my side as I stared silently outside the window. Yes. I think they're lovely. The bird was truly incredible, the person who owned the bird had to be incredible as well. Countess Eliza smiled and spoke in a half-encouraging tone. Then why don't you raise one or two birds of that species, or any other species? Oh yes. It would be amazing to have a chick from birth. Let's bring them together. It was tempting, but I thought about it for a moment and shook my head. No. Seeing one is different from raising one. Queen was exceptionally intelligent because of his master's training. It was unclear whether I liked birds, or just Queen himself. If I had an animal, I would make sure I would commit to it before raising it. I haven't seen Viscountess Verdi since yesterday. She had to rush back to her estate. Troubles again. The ladies dot in dot waiting glanced at each other. Unlike the rest of them, Viscountess Verdi had no mansion in the capital and she frequently returned to her estate due to family matters. The problem was that most of the family matters was often unenjoyable news. I heard the son was gambling abroad. And the Viscount was with a married commoner woman, and the woman's husband sued. Many aristocrats were like this. Viscountess Verdi's son had a gambling problem and the husband had a woman problem. Yes, Viscountess Verdi was certainly burdened with hardship. I was worried, but I couldn't interfere without her asking me. My consideration would touch her pride. And even if she asks for help, it's not something that I could resolve. Everyone has problems. I sighed and reach out to close the open window. Asterisk 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 the next day, more guests arrived at the palace, starting with the arrival of the princess of the southern kingdom early in the morning. The time passed quickly as I exchanged greetings with her and her security was cleared. Maybe it was because of the rain, but today felt particularly hectic. It wasn't until I retired to my room in the evening that I found Queen sitting on the window frame, pining pitifully as he waited for me. I opened the window, and he crept into the room, soaking wet and shuddering. My goodness. Your master sent you in that rain. You're shaking. I'm sure you have a message. With my tongue in my cheek in concentration, I wrapped a soft towel around his body and gently dried his feathers. Queen hesitated for a moment, but soon started dozing in my hands. I rubbed him with the towel until he was completely dry, and carefully pulled the note from his leg. 
The handwriting was smudged by the rain, but this was what it said. Then shall we make a bet. The one who finds the other wins. What was it that I wrote before? Ah, uh. I asked the sender who they were. They wanted to make a bet. I went to the desk and wrote a reply. What would you bet on? After I finished, I looked at Queen and back out the window again. The rain was still lashing heavily against the glass and had been going on for hours. If I sent him out now, wouldn't he catch a cold? Queen was staring at me instead of playing with the towel. I put down my pen and he tilted his head and flew over to the desk. He seemed to scan the contents of the note then extended his leg as if he wanted me to tie the note. No. It's raining now. If I send you now, you will catch a cold. The bird hesitated as if it really understood me, and I drew him in my arms and patted its head. You can sleep with me today. You can go when the rain stops. Come to think of it, he was a male bird. Did a bird consider a human's gender? Why was he suddenly frozen? Asterisk 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 I took a bath then slipped into a gown, and when I returned to my room I found Queen lying on my bed. I was going to make a separate cushion for him to sleep next to me, but he was flat on his back. Could a bird sleep on its back like that? Cute. When I got closer, I marveled even more when I saw that he breathed with his beak slightly parted. He didn't wake up even after I touched him lightly, so I lay myself on the bed next to him. I kept still, feeling a warmth by my shoulders. Maybe because Queen's body temperature was high even though he was a little far away. As I stared at him in wonder, Queen opened his eyes. When I saw the purple of his irises, I was somehow reminded of Prince Heinle. Come to think of it, the prince also had eyes like an eagle. I reached out and swept the bird's cheek, and his sharply gleaming eyes soon slid close again. You're so pretty, Queen. I spoke in a soft whisper, and the bird stretched its body from wingtip to feet, then covered my arm with its wing. Good night, Queen. Chapter 17. Want to make a bet. 2. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 17. Want to make a bet. 2. I woke the next day and saw Queen was gone. The window was slightly ajar, as if he had let itself out. What a smart bird. Even more impressively, he remembered to take the note from my desk. Countess Eliza. Did you clear the paper from my desk? I asked Countess Eliza just in case. No, your majesty. Is it gone? Yes, I think Queen must have taken it. Countess Eliza was also impressed with my story. I thought about the bet as I made my way to the central palace. Queen was quite intelligent, so his owner had to be as well. Perhaps it was Emperor Serum from Blue Bohean. I heard he was quite smart. Moreover, as Blue Bohean was a maritime country, it used messenger birds the most compared to other countries. Your face looks brighter, your majesty. Is that so? Yes. I've been worried about your dark moods, but I'm glad the New Year's celebrations seem to cheer you, your majesty. I see, more precisely, it was Queen's presence that lifted my mood, but if it weren't for New Year's, he never would have come to me. Countess Eliza was right in the end. I worked on my papers with a smile, and as soon as it was lunchtime, I returned to the Western Palace. I usually took my meals at the Central Palace, but I was worried that Queen would be waiting for me outside the window like yesterday. Again. Queen was sitting outside the window again. Fortunately, the weather was clear and he was half dot dozing off in the sunshine, instead of shivering in the rain. When I opened the window, Queen quickly came into the room and held out his leg. I pulled out the note and checked it eagerly, and once again saw the familiar handwriting. I'll bet Queen. I looked at Queen. The bird blinked his large eyes and tilted his head, oblivious to the contents of the letter. Goo. Your master wants to offer you, Queen. As soon as I spoke, Queen jumped and flapped his wings. I pulled Queen into my arms and placed him in my lap, and looked down at his magnificent golden plumage. I wanted to have Queen. I have never seen such a cute, smart and lovely bird before. But, no matter what anyone else said, it was best if he stayed with his master. 
It would be heartbreaking if I won the bet and Queen was let go. No, that was not the best way to describe it. Queen would be abandoned by his master. I was not so happy with the competition either. I was curious of course, but worry stopped me. The reason Queen's owner and I could send messages to each other was because we were strangers. Would we be able to talk in this familiar way even after we have discovered each other's identity? I had to be careful to preserve the dignity of my pose as empress, or else this comfortable atmosphere would disappear. Goo. The bird tapped my hand as I sat still, as if he were impatient for me to start writing I hesitated and took Queen to my desk. I set him down, took out a piece of paper, and wrote a lie. Hint. I'm a man. Queen squawked and flapped his wings as soon as he saw my message it sounded like he was laughing, and I felt embarrassed even though he was just a bird. I scratched his cheek, and Queen turned round and round and rubbed his head against my wrist. Do you think it's fun to lie to your master? Goo. I was glad he was having fun. I felt sorry for Queen's master, but, they won't find me if I wrote this lie. That way, we wouldn't be able to find each other, and we could remain faceless friends like now. You like this too, don't you, Queen? Asterisk 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 it was the day before the New Year's celebrations officially began. I greeted the last minute arrivals, and checked on the New Year's proceedings and the special banquet for the last day. I went to the Western Palace again during lunch hour to see if Queen was there today, but the effort was fruitless. Instead, Viscountess Verdi, who had been away for several days, returned. She still looked quite pale and distressed, but she greeted me. If it's no trouble to you, your majesty, I, it's all right. Tell me. Can I borrow some money? The red dot-faced Viscountess Verdi could not even explain the reason she needed it. About five thousand krongs, the other ladies dot not waiting and I knew though, however. Perhaps it was for her son or husband. Though Viscountess had hurried back to her estate, she could not pull her family out of the mire. I promised to lend her the money without prying any further, and she repeatedly said she would pay me back and left the room shame.faced. I'd rather get divorced. Laura was unmarried and didn't have much sympathy towards Viscountess Verdi. That's as good as throwing away the Lux army. Countess Eliza was patient in explaining this to Laura, but the young lady still didn't seem to understand. But even if she went through divorce, wouldn't her child be considered illegitimate? While it won't happen immediately, there is the possibility that he'll lose the right to inheritance. That's why she's enduring, Laura. So what? If a troublemaker like him becomes heir, he'll only end up sucking his family dry. Hush, Laura. Countess Eliza glared at Laura and she pouted her lips. I'm only worried. Asterisk 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 Viscountess Verdi returned to her estate again, but not everyone could eat comfortably. As soon as I finished my lunch, I quickly returned to the central palace. Near the end of my work day, something happened as I was taking a break. Your Majesty. One of the knights came inside my office and gave me an unexpected report. Prince Heinle wants to see you. Prince Heinle. Why him? I went outside and found him looking at a mural with his back to me. Ah, uh. your majesty. I approached him, and he turned his head and bowed like a knight again. I hope I am not too rude. Not at all. What can I do for you? I was told you would be finished with work around this time. Are you still busy? Did he find out my working hours? He was right though, and I replied that I was almost done and he grinned. That's great. If you don't mind, could you show me the palace? I'd like to look around, but it's so enormous that I'm afraid I'll get lost. Ah. Uh. Then my lady dot and dot waiting you. I was about to give him one of my ladies dot and dot waiting, but he interrupted me in a low voice. I wish for the queen to do it. Chapter 18 Curiosity 1 you are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 18, Curiosity, 1, his voice was soft and sweet, but there was a note of self.important pride in it. And he had called me queen. He was not the only foreigner to do so, but the word felt strange as I had been sending messages with Queen the Bird. Did that mean, Prince Heinle was queen's owner? 
did he think I was his letter acquaintance? I had a moment of suspicion, but soon dismissed it. It didn't matter if he wrote those letters. I had no intention of meeting Queen's owner in real life. The knight standing next to me frowned as if offended. He seemed to think that it was rude for the prince to ask me to guide him around the palace. All right. Nevertheless, there was no knowing when his country would surpass the Eastern Empire. I would not stir up unnecessary trouble with a prince who might succeed to the throne in the future. After a moment's thought, the proud attitude on the Prince Heinle's face vanished, replaced with an innocent smile as he offered his arm to me. I took it, and contrary to his beautiful and fine appearance, his arm felt densely muscled. I let go of it in surprise, and he looked at me curiously. What is it? Nothing. I couldn't very well say that he was more solid than I expected, so I quickly looked away. Have you ever been to the Silver Garden? It's the closest garden to the Southern Palace. It's very beautiful. I've been around the Southern Palace, naturally. I pondered for a moment as we walked along the corridor exiting the Central Palace. The Central Palace was primarily used for work, with many forbidden areas to outsiders, so it was inappropriate for me to show him around there. The Southern Palace was used to house the foreign guests, and he must have toured around the area. Then there was still the Western Palace, we could share a cup of tea, so the Western Palace should be at the end. I could escort him to the Emperor's Eastern Palace, but I was reluctant to run across Rashta. We could easily skip that and go to the North Palace. Your Majesty. I was strolling forward without saying a word, and Prince Heinle called out me. Something in his voice made my ears tingle. I was thinking about what to show you first. Ah. Uh. Then I want to go, before Prince Heinle finished speaking, a familiar person ran towards us from the garden bushes. Your Majesty. Rashta. Despite my efforts to avoid here, she still appeared in front of me. I sighed, keeping on my mask as I nodded to her. Your Majesty, are you talking a walk Rashta's taking a walk too? Yes. I had no idea where her inexhaustible energy came from. Last time I saw her, we didn't part on the best terms. I came from over there. She pointed her finger at the path she had followed, then smiled brightly and bowed to the prince. Hello, I'm Rashta. I thought the prince would be offended by this unnoble greeting, but he smiled unexpectedly and copied Rashta's mannerism. Hello, I'm Heinle. Rashta's giggle was like a silver bell. You're funny. Your Majesty, who is this? I've never seen him before. Heinle introduced himself before I could. I'm Prince Heinle from the Western Kingdom. Wow. Prince. Rashta covered her mouth with her hands, then squealed in excitement. Rashta has never seen a prince. <laughs> Is that so? You really look like a prince. From a fairy tale book. Goodness. You flatter me, Rashta. A pink flush rose on Rashta's cheeks. Are you two taking a walk together? I asked the Empress to show me around. This place is wonderful, isn't it? There are a lot of places to see. I haven't seen everything, but so far, it's been incredible. Unlike the nobles who were embarrassed by Rashta's speech or behavior when they first met her, Prince Heinle carried on easily with her. Rashta asked if Prince Heinle was feeling comfortable, then posed him another question with a beaming smile. Well, Prince Heinle, do you want me to guide you? Prince Heinle's eyebrows lifted. Lady Rashta. Rashta has been exploring the entire palace lately. There's no place I don't know. Rashta glanced and added kindly, Her Majesty is busy, so Rashta will do it for you. Ah. Uh. Thank you, Lady Rashta. But that's all right. The Empress is a great guide. I hadn't even shown him anything yet. Prince Heinle glanced at me apologetically. Ah. Uh. Then Rashta will go with you. It would be more fun if the three of us took a walk together. Rashta attached herself to Prince Heinle's side, and he returned a soft smile. If he allowed Rashta to accompany us, I would simply leave. I thought through the words that would give me a reasonable excuse. Busy. No, I said I was not busy. 
I just remembered that I was busy. No, that was too hasty. Perhaps I had to rush to the bathroom, no, absolutely not. In any case, I didn't want to create a scene of the empress and the emperor's concubine taking a stroll with the neighboring country's prince. There could be no such ridiculous thing. But before I even choose an excuse I'm sorry, Lady Rashta. Prince Heinle turned down Rashta in a gentle but firm voice. Three is too many. Rashta looked surprised, and Prince Heinle left her with a, enjoy your walk, then calmly strode away. He was polite, but surprisingly cold. Usually when someone offered their company, the polite thing to do was accept. I glanced sideways at his profile in surprise. Before I knew it, he returned with the prideful attitude when he asked me to guide him. I frowned and thought, he certainly had a rude personality. He really was a man that depended on his good looks. Was that the reason of the buzz in the social circles? Prince Heinle stared at me while I thought. I avoided his gaze for fear of being too obvious when he asked me an unexpected question. Do you not find me handsome? What was he talking about? I gave a slight frown and Prince Heinle continued. It's strange. People are usually interested in me at this point. Why is the queen so cold? Is my face swollen today? I made sure to dress finely. I must have heard him wrong. I stared at him, Prince Heinle suddenly burst out laughing. Was it a joke? My apologies, your majesty. You were so rigid a while ago. Dot. The woman from earlier, was she the emperor's mistress? Prince Heinle used the term mistress instead of a concubine. This, too, was not typical of nobility, and it produced a smile from me. The emperor is a strange man. How could he look elsewhere with the queen in front of him? Thank you for your kind words, but, there is no need to thank me. If he cannot appreciate you, it is his loss. Perhaps that was why he was called a womanizer. For a moment I was pleasantly surprised. I knew his words were meant to be pleasing to my ears, but his haughty face made me unable to accept his flattery. He looked like the type that would be unwilling to give compliments even if he was held by the throat and ordered to do so. I forced a smile, and he gave me a boyish grin in return. So, if you don't mind, your majesty, would you invite me to the special banquet on the last day of the New Year's celebrations? Those present at the final New Year's banquet were highly distinguished guests of high status, or made great achievements, or were expected to make great achievements. However, the emperor and empress only invited ten guests. Naturally, most of the invitations were already sent before the New Year's, and Prince Heinle was naturally the first on that list. Didn't you already receive the invitation? It couldn't be, I received it. But it was an invitation from the Emperor of the Eastern Empire. When he looked at me again, his eyebrows lifted. I would rather be the Empress guest. I appreciate it, but I have already sent out all of the invitations. Why don't you cross out the Emperor's name and write down your name below? He was speaking nonsense, and he chuckled at his own words, then offered up his arm again. Shall we keep walking? Chapter 19 Curiosity, 2 You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 19 Curiosity, 2 After our stroll together, I returned to the Western Palace. Countess Eliza was helping me change my clothes, when she suddenly exclaimed, Oh! What's wrong? Countess Eliza was smiling at the window. I followed her gaze and saw Queen sitting on sill. That was normal, but today his back was towards us. Countess Eliza chuckled. He flew here, but when he saw you changing, he panicked and turned around. Queen. That bird is so clever, your majesty. Like a gentleman. When I finished dressing, I approached the bird, but Queen still kept his back firmly towards me. He cocked his head when I approached, but didn't turn around. I spoke to him in a soft voice. I'm dressed now. I poked his feathery rear, and he spun around and rubbed his forehead against mine. Did you not look because you were ashamed? Queen nodded his head primly. He really did look intelligent. However, did you come here in a hurry today? Why are you tired? 
Queen seemed exhausted from his journey when he carried the first note, but after his owner arrived at the palace, he appeared to be more at ease. He looked exhausted again today, however, as if in a rush. Queen fumbled a little, then held out his leg with another note. I petted his head and pulled out the scrap of paper. Looking for me. Queen tilted her head and stared. He then went to drink some water, keeping his eye on me. It was a long moment before I finally replied. Looking hard. And you. Queen shook the water from his beak then flew towards me. He looked at the note, then tapped my arm lightly with his wings as if to reprimand me for my lie. He was so adorable the way he reacted to my letters, and I patted his beak again. Asterisk 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 the New Year's celebrations finally began. Fireworks glittered in the sky at night, and people laughed and chatted in the streets by day. Although I had lived in the palace for a long time, the image that still came to mind when thinking about New Year's was the lively pre marriage festival. I opened the window, allowing the cool yet moist morning air to tickle my nose. I inhaled and exhaled deeply, then half dot closed the window and rang the bell next to my bed. After a moment, Countess Eliza entered, dressed more extravagantly than usual. You will be quite busy today. The Countess smiled at me, then quickly lifted the dress she prepared from the closet. My mother had given the dress to me as a gift, a beautiful thing adorned with white pearls and underlaid with layers of snowy lace to give a full skirt. My mother didn't say it directly to me, but I knew that she was worried about me after the rumors about Rashta. It's the first day, so we must all dress up. On an event like this, one should look colorful, but too strong of a color would look tacky. Instead, it's better to make the queen's image stand out. She explained to me that concept was, the queen of snow, then urged me to get up and wash my face. After sliding into the scented bath water and receiving a massage, Countess Eliza washed my hair and placed on light makeup to make my skin look smoother. She helped me put on the white dress, then decorated my hair with more pearls. I slipped on the white shoes, and soon it really was as if I came from a country of snow. You look so beautiful, Empress. I'm not only saying this because you're here. Thank you, Countess Eliza. Countess Eliza seemed to want to speak more, but she smiled silently instead. Perhaps she was about to say something like, Soviesha will be impressed when he sees you. I checked the schedule on my desk one final time, then headed towards the Eastern Palace. From the second day onwards it wouldn't matter, but on the first day it was required that the Emperor and Empress enter the first grand banquet together. I found Soviesha waiting for me outside. He smiled at me gently and extended his arm for me to take. I thought he would be more upset and longing for his lover, but I noticed no such thing in his expression. It was surprising, but I took his arm and we walked towards the grand ballroom. The doors to the hall were wide open. Four guards, dressed in splendid imperial uniforms than usual, stood on each side of the door, and one rapped on the door when they saw Soviesu and I. An official sounded the trumpet, and the noise in the hall subsided. I took a few steps with Soviesu at my side, and an enormous staircase stretched downwards from our feet out towards an enormous hall dotted with the colorful outfits of the guests. Soviesu raised his hand, and everyone bowed at the same time. I took in the crowd, when something I saw made my hands clench involuntarily. Near the center of the ballroom was Rashta surrounded by foreign nobles. Chapter 20 a False Rumor, 1. You are listening to the novel at fametv.com. Chapter 20, A False Rumor, 1. He invited the concubine for the New Year's Ball. It wasn't that concubines couldn't attend the celebrations, but when they did, they were usually of noble status. It was for this reason that emperors would have a low-status concubine's fake marriage to another noble, raising that concubine's status to countesses or marchionesses. However, Soviesu would never take this blindfold approach with Rashta. Rashta's appearance caught me off guard. I turned my head sideways, but it seemed that I was the only was surprised. Soviesu was smiling at Rashta and nodding his head. When I turned back towards Rashta again, she curtsied shyly and looked up at Soviesu and mouthed, This is difficult. Soon her gaze fell on me. When our eyes met, she smiled and mouthed out, Sister. Then her eyes widened as she cutely she covered her mouth in apology. 
she's so naive. The expression on his face told me he found Rashta completely endearing. I felt my heart twist. Despite the fact that I was his wife, I felt like a foreign object caught between the two. The nobles who bowed to us were now looking alternately between Sovieshu and Rashta. Women covered their mouths with their fans, and men whispered to each other behind their gloves. Though they kept their voices low, it was like a roar when all joined in concert. Rashta looked around in surprise and stared up at Sovieshu with a frightened face. He sighed. Empress, can you go down alone? The two of us already walked in together side dot by dot side, and his obligations with me were over. We could go down the stairs separately, but I did not want to give the impression that we were together by force. I made myself speak. We go down together. Sovieshu turned slightly towards me in amazement, but I kept my voice steady. Many of the top foreign aristocrats are gathered here. They would think there is a rift between us if don't go down together. Dot. A conflict between the emperor and the empress could be seen as an opportunity for our enemies and the neighboring countries. We don't have to be a perfect couple, but we shouldn't look at each other unfavorably. Sovieshu's expression twisted slightly. Ah, uh. yes, I suppose so. Rather than taking to heart what I said, he seemed to accept it as an excuse. He gave a regretful smile and reached out to me. Then let's go down together. As he escorted me down the stairs, he nodded towards the crowd and before stopping at a suitable area on the floor. He smiled and lowered his arm. Is this enough? Yes. With his duty done, Sovieshu made towards Rashta without looking back. I stood alone and watched him. The foreign nobles surrounding Rashta welcomed the emperor with a smile and stepped back to make room for him. Rashta quickly nestled herself by Sovieshu's side. So that was what a loving partnership looked like. I wrenched my gaze away. Instead of showing pain, I feigned a smile and greeted the Duchess Tuania nearby. You organized the New Year's celebrations, didn't you, Your Majesty? This is wonderful. Duchess Tuania approached me with a friendly demeanor, ignoring the topic of Sovieshu and Rashta. Before long, the other noblewomen and young ladies came to me as well, and we carried on in casual conversation. Oh, look over there. That's Prince Heinle. Rumors say that he is a womanizer. He has such a beautiful face. I hear that he mixes with dangerous pirates. Because the noblewomen avoided the topic of Rashta, the conversation turned to Prince Heinle instead. Since there are more rumors wherever he goes, he must be seeing someone now, right? What partner would deal with that fire of a person? Prince Heinle is single, maybe there isn't one. Well, he is the future king of the Western Kingdom, so it may be beneficial to marry a woman from our Eastern Empire. But he seems quiet for someone who has so many rumors about him, I listened to them talk about the mysterious prince, and took a glass of champagne from a passing servant. It had only a little alcohol, almost like water. I tipped the drink up to my lips, lifting my head. Through the glass I saw the distorted figure of a man. It was Prince Heinle, staring in my direction. I lowered my head and pulled the vessel away from my lips. I thought it was by chance that he was looking at me, but when our eyes met he didn't turn away his gaze. Instead, he lifted his own glass to toast me then took a drink. He tilted his head, revealing a smooth jawline. A foreign nobleman then caught his attention, and I quickly took my eyes off him. It was then even the most aloof empress cannot help but look at that face. There was a laughing voice from somewhere. My heart pounded, and I turned my head in the direction of the voice. The seats by the wall were occupied with many foreigners and natives. There were too many people for me to know who said it, but I immediately knew who it was. A group of people were holding on to their stomachs as they howled in laughter. It was hard for me to hear, but the person with that voice said something again, and the laughter grew louder. Some of the giggling nobles glanced sideways at me and caught my gaze, and they quickly poked each other in the ribs to signal quiet. Their reaction convinced me of the certainty of my story. They thought I was deaf to what they were saying, but I was not far away. Your Majesty, did you really give her a gift? A lady had been lingering nearby, as if she had been waiting to ask me a question. A gift. 
my voice came out sharp without me intending it. The lady blushed and apologized, but what I wanted was not an apology. I don't understand what you mean, but I'm not angry. Tell me, what do you mean, a gift? I forced my voice to sound normal, and the lady opened her mouth apprehensively. The foreign guests don't know the rumors about that woman. What they say is that she is the first concubine that the emperor has accepted, and you had given her all kinds of gifts. I already knew the first part. But how did I suddenly give her gifts? Then a foreigner asked me, it's all right. Tell me. A foreigner asked that woman if she was all right with being in a love triangle involved with your majesty, and she said yes. She said that both the emperor and empress loved her greatly. That woman said that immediately after she became a concubine, the empress even sent her all kinds of precious gifts to welcome her, communication with foreigners was recent. Moreover, most of the other ladies around looked surprised, as if the gossip was not a familiar topic that spread around society. In other words, the foreigners heard the rumors first and spread it to local aristocrats. I felt dizzy and my knees were weak beneath me. People were laughing at me for sending gifts to my husband's lover to gain his attention. The pride that I had mustered swiftly collapsed like a sandcastle because of a single false rumor. No matter how much I tried to distance myself from Sovietshu and Rashta, I was buried.